Hello, welcome to episode 20. Today's playthrough is probably going to go by really fast. Because I ended up spending a couple hours in the game and when I, you know, compressing a couple hours, it uh, the playthrough ends up just screaming, so We'll see how it goes. So what we're, do what we're doing right now is is finishing the big rectangle of the train tracks around the base. And the idea of, the, of creating a big rectangle is it gives a good pathway for the trains to get around the base efficiently so that you you don't have to try to weave track in and out all over the place. Uh, all you have to do is just bring different areas of the base, you know, st string track from those areas to the, the big rectangle. I usually call it the main line. And all you have to do is string uh, different areas, outlying areas to the main line, and then, and they should be able to get to, to almost anywhere they need to go. And, you know, this time we're fighting through the trees again. Although we just went through a nice straight stretch, but we're right back into the thick of the trees. The construction bots cut them down, but they do end up putting a lot of trees in your inventory. And what I usually do is just put down a chest, fill the chest with the trees, and then shoot the chest with your bullets. And that destroys the chest, and then the trees are gone. You know, I have been... We need wood for our, tele our telephone poles, for our power poles, the inexpensive power poles. But I already have so much wood for those that I probably don't really need a lot more. But, you know, I just went ahead and set up another chest of wood just to be, you know, kind of cautious and... I think I ran out of track that time. Oh no, I didn't. wasn't sure how far to go, so I needed to pull down this uh, upper part. And you can't run train tracks under or over anything. They have to be the, you know, right on the ground. So anything else has to go above them. Or uh, un well, you can run the the belts underground with the undergrounds but you know power can't you can't stick a power pole right on our train track or anything like that now I'm running this line further down because eventually I'll probably end up um, needing to go down under you know south of where we are right now and so I'm going to go ahead and hook up a junction here so that any train can go from any track to the next location. So that uh, junction there will allow that to happen. And I don't think I have any signals in my inventory. There's uh, chain signals and a regular signal. Um, the reg regular sing signal has three lights on it, and the chain signal has one. And we'll get into that here in a minute. So now we're actually done with the with the rectangle, and so I'm going I'm going to be setting up a couple of transfer areas for copper and iron. And here we're going to go ahead and make some chain signals. 
because I'll, I'll need a lot of them. So the regular signals are on the top there and then the chain signal is on the bottom. Reg regular signals break the tracks up into logical blocks. Um, that's what they always say they do. So I set up a an, a splitter there so that the uh, both of those assemblers would get equal amounts of uh, green circuits. So the regular signals um, will stop a train coming in their in direction where they're located. They'll stop a train if there's another train ahead of them on the line. So you, if you put a regular signal down, any train that approaches it will stop at that signal if there's another train further down the track. Now, if you have another signal further down the track and then a train is after that signal, the first signal will be green and the train will be allowed to pass onto the next signal. Now that's not true with the chain signals. The, the chain signal will continuously pass the value of the first regular signal in front of it. So you can chain together like five chain signals and then have one signal, you know, ahead of all five of those. And if that chain, or if that regular signal ahead of all the chain signals is red, that means that there's a train past it, just beyond it, you know, anywhere down the line. Then all of the chain signals will hold traffic at the placement where, on the track where they are. So chain signals chain together the the signal so that that um, the traffic won't be able to pass and it's all based on the the signal that's ahead of all of the chain signals together chain signals also um, perform a very vital part in manage your tr manage your, managing your trains now you may notice there that I put together a whole big array of tracks. And what those tracks, what we call those in Factorio are holding lanes. Another term that people will use is a train stacker. And what those do is they give a place for the trains to wait until the station ahead is open. Now the station ahead, that the train stop, you can see the two train stops there at the bottom. I just added two more. Uh, they have regular regular signals on both sides of them at the, the, the length of my cars, which is going to be two engines and four cargo wagons. And so the, chain, the regular signals are spaced apart so that a single train could fit in the, uh, the area there. And we so the signals are placed so that the train can fit in the place where the uh, stop is, and that gives the the train a, a place that um, it can be loaded or unloaded. And the holding lanes have a um, chain signal at the end of the holding lane. Now the chain signals are all wired to the, um, you know, they're all going to wait until the signal ahead of them turns green. That means that the uh, holding lane is now open. So once the holding lane is open, the chain signal will let the trains in the holding lane move up. And it's kind of random as to which train might go first. I, w I wish it would. It needs to be like first co first come in, first go out, uh, 
first in, first out. That's uh, FIFO. That's an old computing term. So the holding lanes have the chain signal at the head of the holding lane that that, that holds the trains at bay until the uh, holding lane opens up. And then whatever, you know, the first train will then go and take its place and then the other trains will have to wait. But the uh, vital part that the chain signal performs and it's kind of, this is only specific to Factorio. I mean, signals and trains are, are old as the 1800s. But, um, but Factorio has this calculation that's made when a train goes through a chain signal or goes past a chain signal. And what that thing that, that happens is, is a, uh, the train will reevaluate where it should go. And if you don't, okay, if you, you have to put a chain signal and at the entrance to the holding lane. So the track, the single track coming off the main line, going into the holding lane has to have one chain signal at that entrance on the single track so that each train going into the holding lane area will reevaluate whether or not there's a train waiting in the holding lane slot. And if you don't put the chain signal there so that the train reevaluates re what's ahead of it, it will calculate that which holding lane to go into um, way early down the line, so you don't know exactly where it might happen, but it, you know it's going to be the last time it encountered a chain signal on the track. So what can happen is if you don't put that uh, chain signal at the start of your holding area, the trains can end up going down a holding, uh, going and trying to get into a lane that's already filled, because it it had determined that the, that holding lane was open a long time ago, and then by the time it actually gets there, a train has already moved in that location. So that's why you have to have a chain signal at the uh, entrance to your holding lanes. And it's it's something that, that uh, has vexed me in the past, you know, when I first started putting together train systems. Because there really wasn't an explanation for it. And... Uh, that I could readily find. I didn't really understand why the trains would not um, take an open slot when they approach there. So, um, so anyhow, that so right past that um, that first chain signal you have to add. Then you usually you it's not usually. Then you always put regular regular signals at the entrance to each holding lane and then you can see the chain signals at the exit at the top and then each holding lane or each uh, active lane the actual loader unloader lanes you mask those off with uh, red regular signals okay now we spent some time in the, at the factory building uh, a couple assemblers to make these um, logistics chests and we have the regular storage chests the red ones and then the requester chests are the uh, blue ones. And the um, so the left side of our transfer area will be the unloading side, and then the right two lanes will be the loading side. And so we have a we we have two engines. On the front of each of these trains and then four cargo wagons and the reason why I'm not just running one engine is because it does give them uh, extra speed on the tracks and of course trains require uh, power and that's what I just set up right right down at the at the engine side and since we have two engines I have to have two chests so the trains can get filled with fuel now the trains need to be filled with fuel and 
this is an ideal place to actually fuel the trains because we have trains coming in from the smelting areas and then trains going going to the factory areas where, where they're going to be sending their cargo. So this is an ideal place to actually uh, add fuel because we're uh, kind of, you know, killing two birds with one stone. Which is an odd term, but... Uh, so I, I kind of wanted to make this whole train thing as easy as possible. And I thought I could sneak a loader down here, but... Uh, you can't really put loaders on the diagonal track. It just doesn't work. I, I forgot about that. I thought I could just, you know, do that, but no, you can't put, um, you can't put the loading and unloading of trains doesn't work on diagonal track. So I tried my best to make it fit and obviously it wasn't going to work there. So what I did um, was basically start doing a control Z, which is an undo. Yeah, still it's not going to work. So I did a control Z, which is undo, until I had the original design back. And and what I had to do was um, create that little bypass down there so that the fueling train could get to the, uh, the place where it'll be doing its unloading over there on the right. In the past, I've usually just added a fifth lane. Like in this case, we have four loaders and unloaders. Uh, I usually just create a fifth lane that looked just like them, which is kind of, you know, parallel and in line with the rest of them for the fueling train. But unfortunately, by the time I got to that point, I would actually kind of forgotten about it. And, yeah, I'm trying to save space too, so... So I just did that little... Uh, the unloader that that uh, that I added, I actually thought it looked pretty good. So, in order to get the these trains loaded and unloaded at the maximum uh, speed that we can, we need to use the stack inserters. I haven't actually set up a stack inserter uh, assembler yet, so that's what we're that's what we've done now. And I fiddled around with it quite a bit, trying to make it as fast as possible. I even added some speed modules to the the gears. But eventually, you know, I ended up with, with quite a few of the stack inserters, and now I was able to pretty much get fairly close to finishing this first transfer area. So once I get the transfer area set up, then I can actually go and and start setting up the smelters for copper and iron. And I usually I usually set up my smelters right next to the um, resource on the map. And that way I'm not actually trying to transport or move around the um, raw ore that the miners are pulling off of the uh, off the uh, resource on the map. So I'm not moving that raw ore around, especially on trains, because it only stacks at 50. So I mean, it's filling up the trains with quite a bit, and the, you know, the more trains you actually start placing on your rail your rail system, the more congested it's going to be. All right, so we have, you know, basically finished the the iron transfer area. So I just copied it. I just did a control C, copied it, and I'm going to go up here up north. Looks like in a good open space and I'm going to place it a copy of it down here. And this is going to be the copper transfer area. And yeah, here we got all kinds of trees again. I've, I've spaced just a few of the roboports required to for the logistic spots that are going to be moving the copper and iron back and forth between those chests. 
Uh, eventually, I'll have a lot more there once I get uh, further along. You need quite a few of the RoboPorts because we're going to be running a few thousand logistic bots to move the um, the iron and copper as fast as possible. So in order to to get to that number, I mean to to get that many logistic spots, I've actually set up a an assembler over by the construction bot to get to, to get that going. So here's the uh, the signaling again. Now it's important to know something about the way that the the um, junctions work. You always want to make sure your junctions are far enough apart to fit at least one train. And then you, you have to use chain signals to make sure that trains, when they approach the junction, don't enter the junction. And you need both of those things. You need to make sure that the junctions can fit one train between them. And that you use chain signals so that a train isn't um, ever stuck in the middle of a junction. Because... Uh, what can happen if you don't do that your trains can literally get in a deadlock situation where one train can't move through a uh, your signals the way you have your signal set up because another train is blocking it and the train that's blocking it can't move because the first train is blocking the second one so <laughs> you basically have two trains that are stuck they can't move forward because they're blocking each other and you know obviously that's like the worst but the 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 thing is is that it can happen with it with with five trains not just two so you can have like five trains in the situation where all five of them can't move because one of them is blocking the other somehow. And that's why you always want to make sure that, that you can um, fit one train between your junctions. And that you use chain signals to keep trains out of junctions. If there's any train ahead of them, you know, already in the junction waiting for something to happen. So because, um, you know, eventually your, your, your rail network will get congested. And the only way to prevent a complete deadlock is to follow those simple rules. And the, the main rule is to always make sure your junctions, that a train can fit between two junctions. And, and of course, you have to have the chain signals in the junction so that the train doesn't sit there in the middle of a junction because then the the other trains just can't move around. I mean, the trains are going to back up regardless of what you do. I mean, eventually the trains will back up, but you just need to make sure that even though they're backing up and and trains have to wait for things, that they're not getting a complete deadlock situation. Okay, so um now we're going to actually make the uh make train fuel. We're not going to use coal to power our trains we're going to use um we're going to use the best train fuel that you can make and that's the nuclear train fuel to make the nuclear train fuel the first requirement is that you have rocket fuel and rocket fuel is produced by taking solid fuel which is what we're making right now and then adding uh, assemblers to make the rocket fuel out of the solid fuel. I'm checking the uh, factorial calculator right now just to make sure I got my ratios right. So we're going to have eight 
assemblers making our rocket fuel. And you can see they have a liquid requirement, and the liquid requirement is heavy oil. I was thinking about trying to turn them the one way. I didn't think that was going to work, so I turned them the other way instead. So there's our big long line of um, heavy oil. And I just, you know, just hooked, hooked it up to heavy oil, so... Here we're just bringing down the solid fuel. Yeah, I ran out of inserters. And just putting in the power, pretty simple. Okay, to make the actual nuclear fuel requires the centrifuge. And um, I'm not sure why the, the uh, Factorio developers decided to go this route, but, uh, you know, it's okay. We'll, we'll use centrifuges if that's what they, they program the game. I mean, I would think that, that all it would require would be 235... And then just, you know, packaging it up into something that the trains could use to um, to work, you know, work their magic. But because uh, you already centrifuged the fuel. I mean, the 235 has already been centrifuged. But, you know, that's that's just the way it works. You have to use the centrifuge to make the train fuel. So that's just the way it is. Now, you can also power your car with the same fuel. So you don't, this train fuel, I call it train fuel, but it can be used for any any of the vehicles you have. And there's also a tank that you can build. I haven't built it yet, but there's a tank you can build and it can be powered with the, uh, the nuclear fuel as well. I think I'm checking the factorio calculator ratios again. I was kind of wondering how many centrifuges I needed based on uh, how many assemblers I had making rocket fuel. And in the long run, I think my ratios are off. I think I'm making too much rocket fuel. I probably could have got by with a couple less assemblers making rocket fuel, but that's okay. It's, you know, it's still going to work. So now we're going to go ahead and and pull up a belt for the uh the 235 the bright green 235. And we'll just put it on the same belt that the rocket fuel's on. So there's our precious 235 all that took so long to get that stuff up and running but you know, now that we have, we've gone through that phase of actually creating the 100 235s for each one of our uh, our 235 centrifuges. It's just now we got the stuff running out, running out of our ears, basically. So I added a a a last chemical plant to make solid fuel out of hydrogen gas. I think they call it petroleum gas, but whatever this stuff is. I did that so that uh, the the um, I was making most of the solid fuel from light oil, but if we uh, don't produce any plastic or sulfuric acid out of the petroleum gas, then we won't get any light oil after a while. So by Adding that one chemical plant, making at least some solid fuel out of the petroleum gas, that means that we'll at least we'll be making some amount of uh, light oil. Not much, but you know, hopefully enough to keep the our solid fuel process working so that we always have train fuel. Now, I just added a second line to our 
nuclear fuel station here. And this is going to be a place that the, the trains can actually pick up the uh, train fuel so it can be delivered to our different transfer areas. So now I'm just grabbing a couple trains and then uh, making some cargo wagons. And then we'll go ahead and hook up uh, the trains and send them to the transfer areas. Now I'm at, I have to add holding lanes here because we have more than one um, train delivering fuel. Each transfer area has its own train delivering fuel. So they have to be able to stack here. And I may need to add more later on in case they're waiting but hopefully they won't have to wait too long because we'll usually have a fairly good supply of uh, of the fuel so here once again we had read regular signals to the entrance to the holding lanes chain signals at the exit of the holding lanes and then you have to put the um, the one chain signal on the uh, line coming in. So now we're actually riding on the um, train that's supposed to be delivering this fuel. And you can see we're just kind of going all over the place. And we're having to wait quite a bit too. Now we had, we're, the reason why we're waiting everywhere is because I didn't do any chain, I didn't do any signaling on our, the train tracks when I initially set it up for the for the power plant. We only had one train that was delivering the nuclear fuel to the power plant. And uh, so I had to at least put down some signals on the tracks, otherwise we would get blocked everywhere we went. And then, of course, another problem is we didn't have a, uh, a dual direction junction here, so the trains could go to the left if they needed to. And you can see the train just went zipping through there. And those trains, you now, pretty much for the rest of the game, I can't ever stand on a, a train track for any length of time without getting run over. And you can see how fast those trains are going. And uh, yeah, you have to be really careful um, crossing the tracks, especially because we're using the best uh, fuel in the game. And the trains don't wait around for nothing. You can see they're just flying everywhere they go. So I'm just popping a radar down by the transfer area so that I can see what's going on when I'm not there. And that's kind of important because you always want to kind of keep an eye on those things to make sure that you're you're making enough copper and iron to supply it. That's kind of the main thing. So here's where we're going to set up the logistics bots. And I just clutched this together. I mean... I've been doing that more and more this playthrough, just, you know, adding an assembler here or there just to make things. And, you know, that's okay for now. Eventually we'll probably um, set up a real a real item mall. And uh, that's kind of cool. That a real a, An honest item mall is kind of a neat thing because it will just pretty much make everything in the game that's necessary to build stuff. And it's kind of done elegantly and uh, artistically so that's it um, thanks for watching and we'll catch you in the next one